Okay, welcome back. Uh, I think this afternoon's panel is basically uh, for each of us to reflect on our personal journeys, uh, hearing what drew us to this situation, and also what we may have learned about working with conflict and with religious and ethnic intolerance and extremism uh, as it as it bears on our uh, life wherever that is lived. Uh, and also we look forward to hearing uh, Venerable Isaria's plan because he has, a, he has, he has good ideas. Um, so I think I'll begin and we're gonna again try, let's try for about uh, we have a little more space, 10 or 15 minutes a piece. Uh, and then we were going to break into small groups, but I've made a, uh, an executive decision that this is a small group. And so what we'll do after we've presented is we will come off of our uh, exalted seats and make a circle and, and have a conversation. Uh, not just questions to us, but what your experience is and what you think. And we'll finish when we finish. Does that sound okay? Great. So, I'd just like to speak to where I come to this, as I've thought about it a lot. You know, for the last uh, almost 30 years, I've been involved in issues of, particularly issues of oppression and uh, discrimination uh, in Buddhist communities in Asia, and also to some degree in the United States. And I come out of a, an activist background uh, doing civil rights work when I was in high school, uh, and then anti-war work and uh, pretty radical stuff that wasn't, I must say, wasn't, strictly speaking, nonviolent, uh, but that shifted. Uh, and I was very fortunate in 1991 to be hired as executive director of the Buddhist Peace Fellowship. And it was, as I said, it was under that that I began to uh, I began to be involved with an organization called the International Network of Engaged Buddhists. And it was there that I met, so that was 91 or 92, uh, just after a terrible repression in Burma when uh, a lot of the activists and students went to the jungle. Uh, and we had a, a witness delegation there uh, and met with the students met with the All Burma Young Monks Union and met with people from some of the, uh, the ethnic uh, resistance groups. Since then, you know, one stream of this has led to working with the Rohingyas, uh, but I've also been very involved with Buddhists in India. And the Buddhists in India, that the communities that I work with are basically what used to be classified as untouchable. Uh, and they took part in a conversion movement beginning in 1956 uh, under the leadership of a, an incredible figure, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Uh, and he began he converted, he in a you know, they do things in small scale in India. He converted in a, before an audience of four hundred thousand. And then, even as a layperson, he turned around and offered the refuges and uh, the five precepts to all of the people who were there. And they became Buddhists. And that began a conversion movement that continues to this day. And now there are something like, 
30 or 40 or more million people who identify as Buddhists, and quite a few of them have a Buddhist practice, are studying, are practicing, and I've been working with a school in Nagpur, India, and that, that has been training young Buddhists in meditation and in social thinking, in, in basic Buddhism, not just meditation, but also the sutras, uh, the various schools of Buddhism, Theravada, Mahayana, and Vajrayana, and teaching them Ambedkar thought, social thought, and training them to be basically community Buddhist community active, activists, uh, Buddhist community organizers back in their communities, which are mostly rural, but uh, it's just incredibly inspiring work for me. And uh, all of these young people come from very, very poor backgrounds, where, as they were speaking about the Rohingyas, where they were denied education. They're not allowed to go to school. There's, there's no intermarriage. There's no intercaste even sharing of food. Uh, so it's been inspiring. And in one of those trips to, uh, to India about 10 years ago, we were taken into, uh, you probably many of you have seen uh, Slumdog Millionaire. It's, it's kind of a weird movie, but it's images of the slum communities in Mumbai are very real, except what they miss, and this is what we experienced after chanting and meditating with people at a street corner vihara in the middle of the city, then they wanted us to see their homes. And they took us back into this warren of, uh, of little, just very narrow passageways and maybe uh, homes cast concrete that were maybe 15, 15 feet, feet on each side. Uh, sometimes would be, they built a loft so for sleeping. And, you know, it's like, oh, slum. Every house was immaculate. Every child was dressed and getting education. Every parent was supporting their children to to go for as much education as they could get. And I was standing there and thinking, oh, this is like my grandparents who came from Eastern Europe. They fled pogroms and oppression uh, as Jews uh, in what was then Russia. I mean, it was also part of it was uh, Romania, Moldova, it's depending on what army was marching through what year, you know, it, they got traded back and forth, the, the names, but the people stayed. But sooner or later, m grandparents on both sides left and came to the United States. And instead of the horizontal slums that they lived in in Mumbai, they lived in vertical tenements on the Lower East Side of New York uh, that, and a whole village, say, from a whole village from the Ukraine would live in one building. Uh, and they all, they had no money, but they valued education. So in my mother's generation, which was the first generation born here, uh, she and her two siblings they both graduated, they, all three of them graduated from college. You know, and their parents had no education. And this is what I see in the communities that I work with in India. Uh, and I realized, oh, this is, this is in my heart. This is, this is not just an abstraction. It's a historical memory that's in my body. And that's why I'm called 
you know, what I, uh, I'll say after I went to Burma for the first time, I went back many times to the border areas and we'd visit and have built support uh, for Burmese ethnic refugees, for, uh, for Karen, for Shan, and for Kachin, visiting those camps where, which were really awful places. And uh, in some ways, they were, they were about as bad as what I've been seeing, what I saw in Bangladesh. Uh, and they were people from, they were all from ethnic groups uh, that had been driven either out of Burma or deep into the forest in remote areas. There's uh, many of the camps that, all the, I think all the camps that I visited inside Burma eventually were overrun and burned out by the, by the military by the same military that's oppressing the, the Rohingyas. They were directed against, uh, against all the other groups, the Karen and Shan, Pao, Chin, and so forth. So this speaks to me, and it also speaks to, to remember where did our Buddhism come from? You know, our teachers, you have teachers that came from Tibet. Our teachers come from Japan. Our teachers come from Burma. They come from Thailand. Uh, they come from Asia. And they made a great effort to transmit the Buddhist, Buddhism to us in a way that we could actually work with it. And so I feel deeply responsible to, uh, to return that effort in the direction of uh, people who are suffering in, inside Asia, to the extent that I can. And also to recognize that it extends, you know, we have this, this upwelling of, uh, of racism and, uh, you know, white nationalism in this country. And I think it's very much like as in Burma, it's always been going on, or it's been going on historically for a very long time, since the founding of this country. And a lid has been taken off. I think what's going on in Myanmar, that lid has been taken off, and so certain things are permitted to be said. And when you permit something, we know that karma is based on thoughts, words, and actions. Thoughts give rise to words, words give rise to action. Action gives rise to suffering. So when you allow people, when, you, when anything goes in terms of what you can say, then there are consequences that really proliferate the suffering for, for those who are victimized by it. And so just to say, this is what we're seeing here. It's not like, oh, we're having racism again. I thought we were over that. No, we've never been over that. But the kind of sentiments of white nationalism that are, that are somehow acceptable expressions within the discourse that's generated by leaders creates a, a dynamic here in the United States that is very, very dangerous. And I think it's parallel with what's going on. As I said last night, when you look at Mabata, the Society for Protection of Race and Religion, you know, race and religion going together, or relig nation and religion going together, never bodes well. You know, and we've seen this again and again in history. So that's, that's sort of the context that I wanted to share with you from my own personal experience and my, my own thinking. So thank you. Yeah. Great. Um, 
So I'm going to start kind of at a similar point to where I started this morning in terms of my own identity um, and explaining why I do this work and what keeps me going to the question that was asked um, this morning. And then I'll tell you a little bit more about different um, portions of the, what the, of, the, what, of the work that I do um, from different angles. So as you all know, I'm, I'm um, Burmese American Buddhist. I, I, um, I, I grew up mostly out of the country. Um, and so for me, the idea of um, what it meant to be Burmese has been largely constructed you know, through, through, the, through my immigrant experience. Um, and so as a result, I think I didn't necessarily experience a lot of the, 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 the things that people, well, I mean, obviously I didn't experience the things that people ex experience in Burma, both in terms of kind of seeing the, um, the, the, the um, racialization of um, issues there, of, of prejudice that um, does exist, even though people, um, you know, I think I, until more recently lived more in, in harmony, but of just how um, um, focused on the Bama majority and Buddhism, the ethnic identity is, and how hard it is for people who are outside of that identity to be fully Burmese unless they, um, you know, assimilate into that. And you know, I never kind of knew that. I, I kind of had this idea that was told to me that the country was formed after colonialism as a federation of all these different Tainda, um, you know, national ethnic groups that were existent there in that land before the British came over. And I, I um, believed that it was kind of, I, I wanted to believe that it was harmonious multicultural and you know inclusive and certainly you know from what i remember of my young childhood in yangon it was you know more or less that way we had a very diverse set of you know community and friends um, from different religions and different different ethnic groups um, and and I, I think that that you know still exists today in, you know in in yangon even though there's different um, and in other cities, even though that there's um, um, you know, tensions that, that, that have been roiled recently, as we were talking about this morning. Um, so as I became an adult and um, had children of my own, I became, because my, my children um, have never been to Burma, um, uh, my husband is, is, is Chinese American from Hawaii and he's, he's Catholic. And so, you know, we're in an interfaith and, and interethnic marriage where we both are minorities and we both are interested in teaching our children about our respective heritage and our respective faith. So, um, you know, we have always done something we call Sunday homeschool, where we teach the kids about stories from both of our religious traditions. And um, not with the idea that they would grow up to be either Buddhist or Catholic, but that they would be exposed to both. And as they started going to school, um, I would, um, and I still do, um, do kind of a multicultural, like we have a multicultural fair where I, um, I show them how to put on Burmese clothes. And in Thinjan, which happened earlier this month, which is Burmese New Year, I go to the kids' school and I teach lessons about Burmese culture. And so, you know, I grew up with this kind of idea of Burmese culture from my own immigrant experience um, that I treasure very much. And I, I was not aware, I was not fully aware of all the political things that were happening and the, 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 the fact that the Burmese identity is so un- Porous and, and so focused on the singular Bama Buddhist identity. And so when the Rohingya crisis kind of escalated, this was kind of my first awakening to, to all of this. And it was through that that I learned about all the ethnic strife that had happened in other parts of, of Myanmar, which I was aware of, but I was told that, well, there are these separatists who are trying to break away, but, you know, the Tayana are all part of our, 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 our community. I, I began to learn about all this work and reach out to other Burmese people in the diaspora and also with the help of social media, including some people in the country that um, 
you know, feel similarly about this because what I found as the Rohingya crisis began to get international attention is that not only was the focus simply on this binary of the Rohingya versus the Burmese, which, you know, certainly this is the crisis of the day in terms of scale and, and scope and, you know, the, the genocidal intentions, but there's a lot of other kind of similar things in a context that's happening that wasn't necessarily being looked at or understood. But what I found was that a lot of Burmese people that I knew in my life, including in, in, in um, the United States, so people that I know in real life, not you know, that I've connected with on the internet, were, I wouldn't say they were not, they're certainly not supportive of, of Mapata or Urathu, but they are, I, I think that they, they um, believe in this kind of ethnic nationalist idea of Bama that, that's focused on the Bama identity. And with regard to the Rohingya specifically, um, you know, they, they, they um, support the, the, what the, the military, many of them support the, the, what the military has done, not just, you know, support Dong San Suu Kyi and the civilian government, which, you know, I think that's a more complicated story in terms of their role and possible complicity because they really are in, in a difficult place um, with the military, which has so much power and control. But I, I think that I found that so many people in my day-to-day -day life actually believed a lot of what's been said about the, the Rohingya, and really just there was some disregard of, of, of their rights. Um, and so, you know, in the fall of 2017, um, I was kind of having all these arguments with Burmese relatives and friends in real life and on, online, and I was kind of waiting for like a, like a Burmese person to write in the English press, like something kind of strong, um, you know, condemning what was happening. And, and um, you know, I, I think eventually there had been more that's been written, but there, I, there wasn't in those early months, which is how I began to do some writing on this. I'd always done some freelance writing, um, mostly about civil rights issues in the United States. So I began writing in Huffington Post about it, and also later on in Lions Roar, where I still do some freelance work. And through this work that I've done, I've managed to connect with um, activists of Burmese or, or origin and Rohingya origin um, who do this work, and um, you know, many of whom I've, I've never met, some of whom I've met at these conferences. And what I would say is that we found this great community, and we all kind of, um, we're going through the same thing of not a kind of understanding what was happening with our community, and we've been able to connect and 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 find meaning through that, which has been really important to me. Um, I want to talk about some of the kind of different parts of this work, including some things that that this group and your networks might be able to um, to participate in. So one of the things, uh, one of the groups that I've started with Chime Peng, who's here, is a group called Douye. Um, the C Coalition for Civil Rights in Burma. I've just the name we just made up, so the, the acronym. I'm like, what does it stand for? So we are. The, so as many of you know, um, the the media freedoms and civil rights are are um, at risk in 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 Myanmar and Burma. And there are two um, Pulitzer Prize winning. Um, reporters who um, who work for Reuters and who've been jailed for investigating um, a, a massacre of some 10 Rohingya civilians in Rakhine State. They've been in jail for about a year and a half and just last week their final appeal was denied. And this is happening at the same time that just a couple of weeks ago after a traditional New Year's celebration, some um, comedians that were um, doing a uh, traditional Burmese Tatar performance called Thanja, which um, 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 uh, traditionally criticizes different kind of lampoons, different um, um, uh, kind of things in Burma, and they were, they were criticizing the military. Some of those, those um, performers were arrested and charged, and there have been filmmakers and you know, other people who have been arrested and charged and jailed for um, um, exercising their civil rights. So later this week, we're hoping to launch a campaign, um, which we're calling the Blue Shirt Campaign, which uh, we're encouraging people to wear blue shirts, which is the color of the prison uniform in, in Myanmar, um, and to put the name of a prisoner 
political prisoner on their palm and to take a picture of it to post on social media. And it's modeled on an old campaign um, where Dong San Suu Kyi and some other prominent political prisoners um, did a very similar campaign. Um, and so the idea is to resurrect that campaign to remind um, the, the, the civilian government and Dong San Suu Kyi and the NLD of kind of their roots um, in, in um, you know, fighting this type of struggle and having been incarcerated themselves. So our, our goal is we're, we're still getting um, the, the, our ducks in a row, but our goal is the first wave will be um, 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 to, to, to have a number of Burmese um, you know, ethnic minority, Rohingya, like people from Burma to post these pictures. Um, and then to, followed by maybe a, a day or two later, allies, and we'll, we'll send out information through Melanie and Jose and Ellen about that, and we'd love to have everyone participate. So, so that's one piece of the work that, that I've been doing with allies to try to um, push long-term change within the Burmese um, diaspora and within Burma. Um, to kind of think about civil rights and civil liberties and what it means um, and foster inclusiveness in the long run. And that's gonna be probably a long battle, but it's something we're trying to get started in our, from our different vantage points. Another piece of the work that I do is I'm the US coordinator for something called the Free Rohingya Coalition, which is a coalition of uh, Burmese, Buddhist, Christian, and Rohingya and other Muslim um, uh, activists um, mostly outside of the country that are working on protection and accountability issues in Burma to try to advocate for uh, many of the things like Ashley was talking about this morning, um, rights and services for the people that are currently in the camps, mostly in Bangladesh, but also to um, um, try to push for accountability by the military for its actions in um, um, repressing not only the Rohingya but other ethnic minorities throughout the, the, the state for, for, for decades. Um, and even though it's called the Free Rohingya Coalition, we were very clear, we try to, we're very clear in, in our messaging to try to contextualize the current crisis in the broader ethnic context of, of, of uh, Burma, of Myanmar. And then the other piece, which I would love to engage with all of you on, is kind of a Buddhist interfaith response because um, as I've done more of this work and as I've done some writing for Alliance Roar, um, I've, there's been a big interest from the, the, the Western Buddhist community. Um, and you know, I think uh, in other places as well, but I live in the West, I live here, so that's the people that I interact with. But there's been a big interest as, you know, with you guys on this issue in terms of wanting to learn more and figuring out how to help. And I think that um, there's a lot that, that we, can, we can do together. And I'd, I'd love to engage in this with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so where do I get started with my journey? Um, I'm an immigrant as well. I came here to go to school. I went to University, uh, Wellesley College in Massachusetts. I was 17 when I came here. Um, first girl from my family. My parents are originally um, Pakistani. Uh, well, they're not even originally Pakistani. They're, they, are, they were immigrants from India. And... Uh, and Ancestrally, my family is originally Arab, who Arabs who settled in India. So it's so it's part of you know my life journey. <laughs> um, we just part of the world, right? I didn't grow up in Pakistan though. I grew up in uh, in the Sudan, <laughs> just to add another layer. Um, some parts in the Middle East, but mostly the Sudan. Um, so when I see the Sudanese revolution going on right now, you know, uh, my kids were like, why are you so excited? I'm like, just like you guys identify as Americans, that's like for me, I see that and that's my country, you know. Um, so it, I came, became involved with, with the work uh, in, um, with the Burma Task Force spe specifically um, because um, my mentor, Imam Malik, uh, who started uh, the Burma Task Force, is one of, uh, with um, another Burmese refugee who is a uh, Burmese Muslim who left his country. He walked out of his country 
um, because a wealthy businessman family in, from Rangoon and uh, part of the f hospital over there, there's apparently a, a Muslim-run hospital that's hundreds of years old and library. Um, their business was nationalized and taken over by the government. And so his uh, father told him to start walking and leave. So he walked all the way to the border and then somehow made it to the United States. So his, um, when the crisis came to fruition, uh, you know, around 2012 and became really, um, and this task force has previously addressed Bosnia, Kosovo, uh, anywhere where Muslims are a minority. And as, as minorities here, um, we, we get, we find ourselves sometimes even though we're marginalized, and I was just saying this to someone, and sometimes that's the hardest part of being, doing this work, is you're a marginalized community where you are, and then you're advocating for an even more marginalized community somewhere else. So, but there's strength in that, because then you find out how much, you know, even when you're marginalized, you still have freedom. Um, and so, and if we want that to retain that freedom, we need to we need to be in the forefront. Um, I am a journalist. Um, I I uh, I run Muslim Matters, which is a religiously you know we lean um, sort of traditional Islam make um, uh, uh, leanings, and uh, we we found which socially conservative, but. Um, progressive in a lot of our thought processes. So it's kind of interesting being in that, you know, <laughs> uh, in that little sliver and trying to make your space around that. But um, what I was seeing was that this anti-Muslim state sentiment and this anti-Muslim bigotry was rising its head in many different spaces in around the world, and especially as someone who went to school here before 9-11 and then raising children in a post 9-11 world. Um, I have four children and I see constantly how they have to defend their faith in, a, in ways that I never had to. Um, and and to, be, to just not recognize what I saw on television as people professing to be of my faith and finding nothing in common with them and nothing in common with the teachings that I had been taught. I, um, I, I am a student of knowledge as well. I have been studying uh, the religion as a faith tradition. Um, I'm not, uh, like we don't have, or like we don't have female imams um, in, in Islam, in Islamic tradition, but we do have women who st are sheikhs who study uh, the religion and then lead women or, and teach men and women. Um, so that is my tra trajectory. I hope to one day complete my course and be that one day uh, after I'm done stopping the genocide in Burma, inshallah. <laughs> um, so uh, while writing about a lot of these issues and connecting the dots, that Islamophobia, uh, the use of anti-terror, you know, the war against terror and how it was manufactured in the United States but it import, exported to all these different countries. It's being used in India, in Burma, in China, in several other places where Muslims are minorities to surveil and uh, Muslim populations and uh, treat them in, different, in, in a manner that's different from the rest of the society. And, um, so this was something that I felt like I needed to get involved. So I was just starting volunteering, you know. Um, I'm in DC, I, I moved from California to DC. And being, and DC is a really, and just another beast. It's just, uh, it's changed me. It's given me opportunities. I was working for a Muslim newspaper and sometimes I'd be the only Muslim in that space. And I ended up be not being the reporter, I'd ended up being the risk, the person, you know, like the representative of 1.2 billion people, you know, and all the questions were asked. And so, and, and then I realized like there, there just aren't enough Muslims on the streets. And this is, there are not enough Muslims in spaces. They're not enough of us <laughs> in this country, but the ones that 
could be speaking, should be speaking, were not speaking. And so then I started speaking and I started um, advocating and uh, it's, 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 it's nice now to be able to see people and be able to hear them speak like I, I, Linda Sersor or any of these other uh, very active uh, progressive uh, women who are on stage but there's a, there's a long history of Islam in this country. Um, uh, the enslaved people when they came here, one third of them were Muslims. Um, Niger, you know, they were brought over from Senegal, from Nigeria, from the West, Western Africa, and one third of them were Muslim. Like you, uh, you know, you go walk to the shore in Annapolis. I live in Maryland, and capital of Maryland, in Annapolis, and you can see Kunta Kinte's story written out over there. That's our heritage. I mean, that's my faith tradition, right? Um, and so, for us to be otherized here and it, it's just a, a lot of it all tied together. But this one issue was so, like it felt like nobody was speaking up for them. And I'm sure there were people in their silos, but nobody in the Muslim community was, was taking up this cause and, and, and saying this is, this is happening to these people and what do we do about it? So that's how I got involved on a voluntary basis until I just couldn't do it. <laughs> No, well, I was like, I can't do my job, full-time job, and do this as well. And so um, I started working full-time on this cause. And it's been such an eye-opener. It's been um, amazing to be in a place where we can, for the first time in history this year, Kachin, Karen, Chin, Rohingya people, and Burmese Muslims, and American Muslims, and evangelical Christians, and Buddhists, and Rakhine Muslims got together and went to Capitol Hill to advocate for lots of things that would do good for this, to, to stop this genocide. And to be in that room where, and it took, Time it did you know it, this didn't happen just overnight because I remember the first meeting we called for uh, they didn't even want to sit at the same table and to get them to that point and be able to um, facilitate that has been really really powerful and to have them come together um, a lot of uh, them had never been in a mosque before so we took them in a there's this beautiful Turkish mosque in 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 Maryland and we um, had a retreat there and it wasn't to, you know, it wasn't anything about converting anybody or anything, it was just being in a space where they could see the architectural beauty that has come out from the Islamic tradition, where they might have not ever experienced that, right? And so for them to be there and then be able to break bread together and speak Burmese together and us just to be on the sidelines and just facilitate that, it was just really, really beautiful. and. Um, the record and the bonds that have been created, uh, and they're keeping in touch. And there, these are young. Some of them are young Kachin Americans. There are some Rohingya Americans. There's some, um, and then and they're keeping it going. And so that's been really so that the Faith Coalition was created uh, was created for this sort of work. And we have some definite asks of uh, of the American Buddhist community because we want you guys to, you, you have so much privilege here, especially um, right now your senator, Senator Gardner, heads the, com at the committee where this Senate bill is under. This is a pretty powerful Senate bill. It, it is good for all people of Burma. Um, and we need help. He, it's under, we need you all to ask him for a hearing on this bill. Uh, on, because he heads the human rights com uh, uh, the committee. It, this bill has been not brought to, like I told, said earlier, by Senator McConnell, and we need pressure. Uh, we need American Buddhists to step up, step up and I'm, we're going to pass around um, action alerts um, that you can uh, work on and, and call, and if you guys could take that cause on yourself and spread it around in your entire state so we've printed out enough that they can be shared here, and if some people could take a few and sh 
spread them around, that would be really, really beneficial. Um, there has been history of American Buddhists helping in Burma where no one else could help. So that's another ask that we're asking. We want you to ask Senator McConnell, to ask Aung San Suu Kyi, to let you all give aid to the people who are stuck in Mangdao. This genocide is not over. The military is surrounding those villages. There's no food, nothing going in, nothing coming out. It's a terrible situation right now. And you all are the best in the, in the best space to be able, because of your, your identity as Americans, as white Americans, and as Buddhists, to be able to ask for this, um, to, be, to let um, Hazan Aland uh, you know, uh, work, and uh, you've done this before, and to do it again, because it's so needed. We can't get in there. I mean, American Muslim relief organizations were kicked out of the, the, the Bangladeshi camps until we advocated for them to come back in. So we can't do this. You know, we're, we're still, as I was saying, being marginalized, it's hard. It's, it, I can, I mean, we've been, I cannot walk into some of these senators' offices dressed the way I am dressed. But, so we hired a evangelical lobbying firm. <laughs> <laughs> gotta do what you gotta do, right? Uh, our spokesperson, Nicole Lee, you've met her? Head of the Republican National Committee for Women. She can get into places that, <laughs> that, and she's been amazing. She has been such, so a lot of times I feel like we, uh, we're, we, we, we say, oh, this person can't work for this cause because we disagree with them on everything else. But maybe we agree with them that these people don't deserve to die a slow death, right? So, so this is something that I really, really, so I'm going to set this around and I hope um, t that we can have many, many more. Whatever you learn today, please pass on this information. It doesn't take much, just you have everything, we'll leave behind pamphlets. Um, you can go in e any of our websites, the Free Rohingya Coalition has an amazing website. Just, just forward the information to even like 10, 15 people in your, put it up, post it up on your Facebook page. Just little acts makes a difference. June 19th, we're having Burma Advocacy Day again. There's an ask for it again. We had one in March, we're having one again. We ask five Buddhist leaders, American Buddhist leaders, to come bring 20 lay people with you. I'm giving you an assignment. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah.